Okay, so time to get started. <clears throat> so we were talking last time about points and vectors and uh, that kind of stuff. Um, so we're going to get some algebra on the page now. Uh, here's a, for example, a vector in R2. Uh, you see here in the xy plane. And uh, let's uh, try to figure out some relationship that you know, possibly we might be able to find between the magnitude of the vector and the coordinates of the vector. Now, keeping in mind, you know, the way we use arrows to represent vectors, the idea is you represent magnitude by the length of the vector. Right? So when we say we want to compute the magnitude, really what we want to compute is the length of this arrow. And the length of that arrow, well, it's just the hypotenuse of this right triangle, um, this part of which is V1, and this part of which is V2. And uh, that leads to, of course, uh, the Pythagorean relationship between uh, magnitude and coordinates. So it's a re real nice little calculation. Um, now, um, there's a related calculation that I want you all to do, and that is I want you to confirm the formula for the magnitude of a vector in R3. So if you have a, uh, a vector here, there's your vector V, and let's suppose you know that it's coordinates, right? The three different coordinates are V1, V2, and V3. So, uh, so you know, this distance is V1, that's V2, and that's V3. How would you compute um, <coughs> This, uh, this magnitude here. And uh, the punchline, of course, yeah, I've got it right, right there written in the book. That's what the answer is. The question I want to pose to you all is why? Right? So what's the, what's the uh, justification for this formula? Aside from, I don't know, looks like the same formula above, just adapted to three variables. Right? That's not an argument. Right? Cosmetic familiarity. It's not an argument. Um, so think through how you would do that. Now, the hint I'm going to give you uh, as you're thinking about this, let's uh, come back up to this picture, and uh, let me zoom in, and um, <coughs> uh, let's see here. Oh, I needed to do that. Uh, let's see here. There we go. Okay, so um, the uh, here's the hint. The hint is to draw that line. And what you'll notice, having drawn that line, is that we now have two right triangles. There's that right triangle there, right? And then there is this other right triangle there, right? And if you write down the Pythagorean relationship for both of those triangles, um, and then solve for what you're interested in, namely this hypotenuse of the green triangle, then uh, the answer falls out. Okay, I want y'all to fill in the details on that. Yeah. Uh, question. Yep. That line there in the yep. XY plane, is that it's not the projection of the line that's kind of above? It is. Okay. Yep, 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 totally. Sure. Okay. All right, so give that a try. Make sure you can uh, do that argument. And by the way, when you, I do this a lot uh, in my classes. As I say, uh, hey, here's an exercise for you guys to work out. Um, so... Uh, I think it's a great idea to actually do those. For one thing, uh, it, conscious or otherwise, and mostly otherwise, you know, when I when I give suggested exercises like this, it's because oh, this is something that I think is interesting. It's a good use of your time. It's something that's relevant to the material, and I think it's uh, at a nice level of challenge. And I'm actually kind of in the market for exactly that combination of characteristics when I'm thinking about exam questions. So, inadvertently. Sometimes and sometimes consciously, but very often inadvertently, I end up making exam questions that are, in fact, questions that I proposed as a, hey, here's something you might want to try uh, in class. And I didn't necessarily plan it. Right? So anyway, I'm not saying that I'll make this a test question, but I'm saying I, I, I don't know <laughs> what I'm going to decide to put on a test, and it would not stun me if I made this a test question. So anyway, something to think about. So give that a try. Secondly, um, don't just uh, kind of eyeball it and say, oh, yeah, I can see how that would work out. Please write out the details for two reasons. First of all, sometimes it's not as obvious as you might think it is. Right? And secondly, on an exam, you're going to have to write out the argument. Right? You can't say, yeah, I totally get it. <laughs> 
right, on the exam. You've got to actually give me the argument. And this process of writing out an argument, writing out an explanation for why something is true, is non-trivial. And it uh, takes practice uh, to be able to do it well. Um, so if nothing else, even if you get it, even if you see where this is going, please, I encourage you very much to write it down for the practice in writing. Uh, that'll be very valuable on an exam. Okay, moving along. Um, <clears throat> how do we add two vectors? Um, let's see, oh, gosh, let me just come down to here. So what, what does it mean to add two vectors? If I want to say, you know, V plus W. Before I get to the formula that, of course, you all can see because you have the book, um, let me point out that uh, there's a philosophical perspective to be observed here, and that is this is not a question to which we have to find, you know, the right answer. This is a choice. When you're doing math, when you're making definitions, you choose definitions. You cannot prove a definition because it's a it's a choice. You get, the word does not, you know, before you define it, it does not have a definition. There is no right answer to find. Right? So we don't uh, prove definitions, we choose definitions. So, so as we go at this question, you know, what does it mean to add two vectors? Keep in mind, we're, we get to choose what we want it to mean to add two vectors. So let's choose reasonably. Now, um, next point along these lines I want to make, uh, and I just need a little scratch space, so let me come back up here. Um, I'll show you a, an idea that I had one time. I think I was about six or something when I had this idea. Right? And I was trying to learn the multiplication tables. I don't know, is that six? How old are you when you learn multiplication tables? At a ballpark, right? And I, I oh my gosh, it's so, so much to memorize and so arbitrary seeming, right? And I came up with this, I thought, clever idea to redefine multiplication, right? And the idea was, well, let's just do stuff like this. Well, four times seven, let's just call that 47. Boom, easy. Now I don't have to memorize a bunch of multiplication tables. Right? Everybody see the, the allure? Right? There's nothing, there's no law that says you can't do this. I could define an operation called the, 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 the Bray product, right? And it goes like this it's the concatenation formula. That is a formula I can write down. Why is this a bad idea? <laughs> well, it's a bad idea because the fact that it's easy to compute doesn't magically imbue it with meaningful interpretations, right? So when you're coming up with a formula for, uh, for you know, for your when you're choosing your definitions, your choice should be based on, okay, I want the operation to represent something. I want it to connect to things that I'm interested in, things that I care about in a natural way, right? I don't just want it to be easy to compute. So uh, <clears throat> lots of... Um, Students would look at this formula down here I have at the bottom of the page for how to add two vectors. And let me rewrite that a little bit. Let me rewrite this as uh, V1, V2 plus W1, W2 equals V1 plus W1, V2 plus W2. And you can see how this is algebraically very alluring because we're just adding the first coordinates and we're just adding the second coordinates. Algebraically super tempting. There is even a temptation to say, well, don't we have to do, I mean, isn't this what addition is supposed to be, right? And I will point out that no, there's no supposed here, right? We've never before today um, made any definition, uh, <clears throat> any discussion at all of what it should mean to add two vectors. For example, until yesterday, we hadn't even defined vectors, right? So there's no supposed to. I don't have to do this, right? So I want you to be suspicious of this formula here at the outset because this kind of looks suspiciously like, uh, you know, my idea from 40 years ago about how uh, you should add, how you should multiply numbers. Which you multiply by just kind of concatenate, and there's your new number. It's super easy. Well, this is super easy to compute. Right, look great on the page. That does not mean that this means anything natural. This could be absolute uh, interpretation-free garbage. 
And until we have persuaded ourselves that this actually means something, that that this connects to ideas we care about in some way, uh, don't be too in love with this idea. Okay. Now let me show you why it is, in fact, very natural. <laughs> it's a really good idea for how to add uh, two vectors, and um, it uh, it comes from the following uh, picture. Well, the following picture connects. So, how do we add two vectors? Well, wait a second. What do vectors represent? Lots of different things. Okay, here here is the very first thing that we ever mentioned that we eventually represented with a vector, and that was displacements. Right, so let's think about, you know, as we're trying to decide what it should mean to add two vectors, let's start off with, well, what should it mean to add two displacements? Right? If I have an instruction which says, go that direction by that distance, now I also, you know, also have, uh, well, there's this other thing that says, go uh, that direction by that distance, what should it mean to add these two displacements? And I propose, I think it's a very simple, uh, natural um, uh, idea that it should be compose the displacement. So first, displace yourself as instructed by the green vector, and then before resetting yourself, in other words, from your new location, now follow the W instruction, displace yourself by that amount. Right? And so if you do the one displacement then followed by the second displacement, you might naturally want to call that the sum of the two displacements. And so all in all, of course, we started there and ended there, thus making this arrow here representative of the sum vector V plus W. So this, this would be a reasonable choice to make for you know, what it should mean to add two vectors. It's reasonable because it is directly motivated by one of our basic interpretations of vector, you know, uh, metaphors, you might say, for vectors, namely the idea of displacement. So motivation, right? This is geometrically natural. Uh, <clears throat> they didn't tell me this when I first saw vectors. I, I, I mean, I saw it in a high school course, and what do you expect? Um, but uh, I was just told that, you know, head to tail is just, well, that's just how you add vectors, um, what do you mean, why? Do what I tell you. That kind of a thing. <laughs> and I remember thinking, it's really weird. Why would you head to tail? How strange, right? But if you think about it from the point of view of displacements, it's very natural. All right. Now, what I'm going to leave is another exercise for y'all. Think about how it is that this picture that we now have a natural geometric motivation for, why is it that that picture gives rise to this formula? Not a big deal. It's just a matter of thinking about, you know, well, where do they, how do these components get represented on the picture, and just observe that. Well, yeah, sure enough, it's exactly this formula. Just think that through. This formula equivalently. By the way, <clears throat> this uh, you know rewriting the addition of two vectors like this is one of my uh, easiest motivations that I can give y'all for why it's pretty convenient sometimes to write vectors vertically. Right? It's by writing the vectors as columns that you can see how it just jumps off the page, how you're adding the first components and you're adding the second components. It really doesn't come through when you write it like this. Right? So that's just one motivation. There are much more sophisticated motivations that we'll talk about in Chapter 3. Okay, what should it mean to multiply two vectors? Well, again, let's think about displacements. I have a modest proposal um, if you are... Uh, if you're, whoops, if you are starting with the idea of displacing in, uh, you know, some direction by a certain amount, C times that, how about same direction, C times as far? Doesn't that seem like a reasonable idea for a scale of multiplication? So that's what we go with. It's not hard to uh, persuade yourself then that uh, this is the formula. Uh, for a scalar vector multiplication, <clears throat> so so these are reasonable choices that we're that we're making here. By the way, in addition to being reasonable choices, these are also the standard choices. So um, so we're we're going to make these choices partly because it makes great sense, and partly because well, in fact, planet Earth is going this direction. So we better get on board. This is how this is what everyone else does. Okay, now there is a a little bit of a problem with uh, this suggestion here. You know, look at this picture multiplied by a scalar C. 
you know, just same direction, but by you know, stretch the magnitude. What if C is negative? You can't have a negative magnitude, right? You can't say go that way a negative distance, or at least we don't think of it in that in those terms. So a uh, reasonable proposition, though, is that you just interpret the negative as changing the direction. The opposite of that direction is that direction. Right, so that'd be a reasonable choice to make. If you're multiplying by a negative scalar, just, um, yeah, you know, in terms of magnitude, you multiply by the absolute value of that scalar and then just go the other way. And the really good news is that this then gives you exactly the same formula. When C is negative, this formula still works exactly as written. So we don't need a separate formula for it. That's kind of nice. Okay. <clears throat> All right, here's another suggested exercise. Uh, don't underestimate this exercise. It's not as obvious as it looks. Um, this is a uh, true statement. If you take a vector and multiply by a scalar c, the magnitude is equal to the original magnitude times the absolute value of c. Now, it, it would have been tempting. A lot of students might have, if I had, you know, if I had done a sneaky thing and if I had started by writing down that, right, I'll bet you a lot of students might not have called me on it because, you, I mean, the intuition is, well, look, if you're stretching the magnitude, that's, you know, multiplication as you stretch the magnitude, then you, you're multiplying the magnitude by that value. I mean, it seems perfectly clear, right? But that's not true unless you put the absolute values in there. Okay, well, you know, sure, of course not because... This magnitude's got to be positive. It's a magnitude. Magnitudes are positive. This magnitude's positive. You cannot have positive equaling to negative times positive. That doesn't work, right? So we know that without the absolute values, the formula couldn't be true. That does not necessarily mean that with the absolute values, the formula is true, right? So my question to you all, to y'all, is to think through, you know, how would you prove that this is actually true? And the way you're going to do it, it's a very straightforward calculation. You know, whoops, I'm in the wrong color. Uh, you know the formula for the magnitude of a vector. Let's, by the way, let's just restrict our attention to vectors in R3. Let's say just R3. You know the formula for the magnitude of a vector. You know the formula for a scalar times a vector and then how to then subsequently take the magnitude of it. So what you're going to do is you're just very directly going to write down with formulas we just talked about what that is and you're going to rewrite and you'll find that you get exactly this. Um, now, one last thing I have to show you before I release you to, you know, off you go on this this question is I, I need to talk a little bit about square roots. Um, <clears throat> square roots are misunderstood very often in high school classes. Um, I don't know. They, the, the issues of pluses and minuses and absolute values very often are just kind of swept under the rug. Um, a lot of high school presentations or middle school, I don't know, uh, presentations of square roots say that it's just undoing a square. Right, but it's not true. Um, Exactly. This symbol means a positive square root. That symbol means positive. Now, the term square root allows for the possibility of being either positive or negative, but that symbol means positive. Okay, so... Uh, Y'all have seen, for example, stuff like, uh, you know, you've seen, uh, you know, people write plus or minus square root of blah, 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 like in the quadratic equation. Right? Um, okay, well, this symbol means positive. And it's because this means positive that if you want to allow for the possibility that what you're writing down could be either positive or negative, you've got to explicitly put that positive or negative in there, right? This uh, symbol by itself means positive. So, for example, if you were to write, you know, square root of 9 equals uh, plus or minus 3, that is false. Right? Um, square root of 9 is 3. And if you were to write it in words, you could say uh, the, uh, the square roots 
of 9 r plus or minus 3. That's cool. Right, but the symbol means positive. Okay, so keeping that in mind, you know, is it true that square roots undo squares? Well, not really. The square root of the square of a number is not necessarily equal to that number. Minus signs are the issue, right? K could be negative. The square root of k squared cannot be negative. That symbol means positive, right? So, in fact, it's the absolute value of k. So square roots do not exactly undo squares. They stick an absolute value on there because of the sign issue. Anyway, think that through. Uh, this issue here is why you get absolute value of c um, in, uh, in as you go through and do that calculation. All righty. Uh, whoops, I hit the wrong button. There we go. Okay, how do you subtract two vectors? Um, there's a nice way to think about this. This is my favorite way to think about vector subtraction, and that is, well, it, it, it is what it sort of must be. If you want to subtract V, um, if you want to take V minus W, notice, uh, whoops, that uh, W plus V minus W, Wait a second. If I have W and then I add V minus W, I sure hope that the minus W and the plus W would cancel. This had better be V. Right? So this sum, the green plus blue had better be purple. <laughs> right? And with that in mind, what we have here is a nice interpretation of what it means to subtract uh, two vectors. Uh, you put the two vectors in standard position, the V and the W, you put them in standard position. The difference between two vectors is represented by an arrow that goes from the head of W, the one you're subtracting, to the head of V, the one you're subtracting from. So, nice. Um, by the way, I can never, myself, I can never remember, I can never keep it straight. Wait a minute, is it from the... Is it from the head of V to the head of W, or is it from the head of W to the head of V? Which way does it go? I, w I can't memorize stuff like that. I, j I have to kind of think it through and cheat and be like, well, it points in whichever way makes the obvious addition work. I have to think it through every time. Um, so anyway, for your consideration, you might not just memorize head to head. You might think through which way it's supposed to go. Okay, um, here's a bunch of seemingly boring facts uh, about the operations that we just just, just defined. Um, vector addition, scalar vector multiplication. You look at these, and your first reaction might very well be yawn, boring, of course. Didn't I learn this in elementary school, etc.? Right? I want to emphasize, no, you did not learn any of this in elementary school. You learned some some properties of uh, operations for which we use the same symbol. But y'all just learned this operation um, 15 minutes ago. Right? So you definitely didn't see it in elementary school. That'd be a heck of an elementary school. Um, and likewise down here. So we use the same symbols, but they're not the same operation. When you're adding two vectors, this is not the addition that you learn in elementary school. It's a brand new operation applying to these new objects called vectors that we're just learning about. So this is all brand new equations you've never seen before. And thankfully, these are all true, right? Okay? But they're not true because they're obvious. They're just they're true because you can prove them. So, um, for example, you know how do you know that that's true? How do you know that v plus w is equal to w plus v? Well, each of these things you can write down in terms of coordinates, right? You can write down v plus w's coordinates. Uh, you know, v1 plus w1, v2 plus w2, etc. Um, this vector here, w plus v, you can write down its coordinates, and you can directly confirm one at a time that those coordinates are equal. Why, by the way? Well, these coordinates are equal because I know from elementary school that addition of real numbers is commutative. Right, so, so uh, 
by coordinates, it's old news. But you have to make the observation to, about all the coordinates to draw the conclusion about the similar looking statement about vectors. Okay. Likewise for all the rest of these equations. <clears throat> okay. A um, couple more quick ideas until we move on to the next section. Uh, it turns out the idea uh, of a unit vector is really important. Uh, a unit vector is simply a vector, a vector whose magnitude is 1. Sorry? You said unique No, a unit. Unit oh, vector? Sorry. Yeah. I'm yeah, sure. no worries. No worries. Uh, yeah, a unit vector. Um, and it ends up being useful. Uh, we're going to see some nice applications of this later. It'll be uh, chapter 4, really, before it starts getting handy. Um, but uh, it is very useful sometimes. Um, so it's just a little bit of terminology. If a vector's magnitude is equal to 1, then we call it a unit vector. Um, some standard examples are what we call standard basis vectors. Standard basis vectors, for example, these guys here. Um, these are the vectors that point along axes. Right? So along the x-axis, along the y-axis, along the z-axis with magnitude 1. And it's really easy to write down the formulas for standard basis vectors right? because they point along axes. So in R3, these are the standard basis vectors. In R2, those are the standard basis vectors. Um, I end up being really important, as it turns out. So uh, by the way, the names that we give to these, uh, there's different conventions. Uh, in, in my book here, uh, we're going to call these E1, E2, E3 when we're in three dimensions, E1 and E2 when we're in two dimensions. It's a, it's a very standard notation. <clears throat> now, sometimes uh, this gets referred to as uh, I, and that gets referred to as J, and likewise here, I, J, K. Uh, that's also pretty standard notation. Um, the only reason I don't like this notation here is it really kind of ties you down dimensionally. Right? We're kind of stuck to two and three dimensions if we name them like this. I mean, what would happen if I needed to, I, I don't know, maybe I'd take an econ class and I have to write down some vectors in R7. Am I going to use I, J, K, L, M, N, O? It gets weird. right? But it is no problem to write down E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, E6, E7. You don't run out of letters. So subscripts are handy that way. Um, so I prefer calling them E's instead of I. Okay. Uh, lastly, handy little trick. If you find yourself with a vector, V, non-zero vector V, not necessarily a unit vector. And what you need, though, is you need to find a unit vector that points in exactly that direction. You'll be surprised how often we need this. It's going to come up a lot, as we, especially later in the course. But uh, if you need a unit vector pointing in the direction of your given non-zero vector, you take that vector, you divide by the magnitude of that vector, and uh, this then is the unit vector uh, pointing in the same direction. So it's, a, it's a very handy trick. Just take a vector and divide it by its magnitude. That will give you the corresponding unit vector. Uh, I'm going to leave it as an exercise for you all to read through the proof that this is indeed a unit vector. If you take this vector and just compute its magnitude, you can directly observe that the magnitude is 1, and again, therefore, as required, unit vector. So just go through and read that algebra. Take it through. Works very nice. Okay, moving on to the next um, the next section, uh, dot products. So let's talk about the fact that we're doing products of vectors now. Note that was conspicuously absent last section. All right, we talked about how to add vectors. We talked about how to multiply a vector times a scalar, but we did not talk about how to multiply a vector times a vector. And it turns out that uh, it's not. It's not as easy to motivate formulas that could reasonably be called products uh, of vectors. It's kind of a tricky thing to do, but seemingly 
uh, in contrast to that, it turns out that there's two really good ways to do it. There's two geometrically natural formulas for what could reasonably be called products of two vectors. So we can't just talk about the product of two vectors. It doesn't make any sense. We need to be able to talk about both kinds of products. So they have names. Here we're going to talk about something called the dot product. Uh, and then in a little while, uh, 20, 30 minutes, something like that, uh, we'll start talking about some a different operation called the cross product. They are totally different operations. They have totally different geometric interpretations. They're both important, as it turns out. Okay. All right. So uh, always be clear when, uh, when you're talking about multiplying which product. Here we're talking about the dot product. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the formula. Here's the formula. If you're in R3, uh, the dot product of two vectors is um, it's kind of a strange-looking little formula, I'll confess. Let me uh, zoom for effect. You take the two vectors that you're dotting. You look at the coordinates. You multiply the coordinates kind of pairwise, and then you add those pairwise products. Weird, right? I mean, arbitrary seeming, right? Strange. <coughs> By the way, here's another thing that's really strange about the dot product of two vectors. Notice we take a vector and another vector, and in multiplying by them, we don't get a vector. We get a scalar. We get a number, right? This is just a number. The coordinates, V1, W1, etc. These are just numbers. When you multiply them, you get numbers. When you add them, you get a number. So vector dot vector is scalar. It's a very strange little formula. Okay, so again, you know, is this a uh, six-year-old bright idea of something that'd be easy to write down and has no natural geometric meaning? You should be suspicious of that because it's a weird formula, it's suspiciously convenient to write down, seemingly arbitrary. You, you, you should have a raised eyebrow on whether this is at all meaningful. Now, of course, now strategically, you know I wouldn't waste class time on it if it wasn't meaningful. Um, okay, so uh, I, I must confess that why this is meaningful, you know, what the connections are between dot products and geometry are a lot harder to motivate than adding vectors. With adding vectors, we draw a picture. Hey, displacements, easy. Here it's going to take us a little work to get to it, uh, but there are some surprisingly good connections to geometry in this formula. Okay. All right. Start with uh, a couple of algebraic properties. Please don't be impressed by these algebraic properties. Again, it's old news. I mean, it, it looks like old news, that is. Doesn't this look just like formulas that we wrote down in elementary school? Of course, they're not. These are brand new. We just defined the dot product. Just because I call it a product does not mean that it behaves just like multiplication from elementary school. Absolutely not. So it is not obvious that these are true. Uh, each one of these requires a, a, a computation. You know, compute the thing on the left from the definition. Compute the thing on the right from the definition and then use what you know about, you know, scalar multiplication and scalar addition to show that, yeah, sure enough, they are in fact the same thing. So there's a calculation required for each one of these. Make sure you do at least a couple of, I mean, at least one of these and persuade yourself of the others. Okay. True facts, though. Very nice. Um, again, kind of unimpressive. The, uh, the fact that I could write down an algebraic formula that has some, dare I say, uh, familiar, borderline obvious algebraic interpretations. Is this natural? Does this mean it's geometrically natural? No. Where's the geometry in that? Right. This is not geometrically persuasive. By the way, here's a weird fact. There are lots of other formulas that I could have written down. I could have written down totally different, you know, something totally different from that. That would make these properties still true. <laughs> all right, so this is not impressive at all. Okay. All right. Where is the connection to geometry? Here's one. If you take a dot product of a vector with itself, you get magnitude squared. Now, is that impressive? I don't know how impressive it is, but it's um, 
it is a connection to geometry. There's a dot product that I just defined about which I'm suspicious. And that's an unavoidably geometric notion there. Magnitude, length, clearly geometric. All right, so, okay, that's something. Now, uh, it's less impressive based on the fact that uh, this is a special dot product. This is a dot product of a vector with itself, specifically. There's no comment in here on what geometrically it might mean if you take a dot of V and some other vector, right? Nevertheless, anyway, starting point, it's a little something. Okay. Um, next thing I want to show you is um, it's called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. It's a little bit more impressive, arguably. Notice that it involves any two vectors, V and W. So it's a little broader statement, a little bit. Um, connection to geometry. Magnitudes on the right-hand side. Well, that's dot product connected to geometry. I mean, this has got some. This is a definitely. Oh, okay. Well, there's. Mm, that's kind of interesting. Um, but uh, the the, uh, the disappointment in this formula, of course, is that it's not an equation. This is less than or equal. Right. I'm not saying that this dot product is exactly. It's that geometric concept right there. No, I, this is a loose and sloppy statement about how well this algebraic thing. I mean, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's. I mean, there's a connection to geometry in the sense that this is never bigger than that, but it's not equal to the geometric ideas. So a little disappointing there, uh, but nevertheless, true fact. Um, here's where it starts to get really good. Uh, we have a theorem down here. Um, for any two non-zero vectors, V and W, the dot product is exactly equal to the magnitude of V, that's a geometric thing, the, times the magnitude of W, that's a geometric thing, times the cosine of the angle theta between the two vectors. Theta, an angle, is a geometric thing. Right, so, so this is really strong. Geometrically, wow, I mean, the dot product any two vectors, totally broad, equals, none of this sloppy inequality business, equals, and then everything on the right is all geometry. So this tells you right off, the dot product is geometrically natural. Now it's got a weirdness in the sense that there's a cosine in there, and why are we multiplying the magnitude? I mean, it, it, you know, uh, it's, it's a little weird. Nevertheless, this is clearly a strong connection to geometry. Okay. Yeah? How's what now? Oh, how do we know it's true? Yeah, that's a great question. That's the next thing we need to do is I need to persuade you why this is true. Yeah, so uh, for now I'm just uh, making the assertion. By the way, I should have uh, said this uh, back here. Um, this is a nice exercise. This is something y'all can prove for yourselves. It's, it's, it's two lines, right? Just write down the formula. What do you get when you dot a vector with itself? Just use the definition. What is the magnitude squared of a vector? And you just observe they're exactly the same equation. Um, this one is going to take a little bit more work uh, to do. Uh, it's on the next page. Here's our scenario. I uh, suppose I have a vector V, a vector W, and an angle theta between them. Let's look at V minus W. There it is. Uh, notice that these three vectors arranged as I have them as arrows make a triangle. Triangles satisfy this equation called the law of cosines. And now I have, I have a prediction that most of y'all have at some point in the past seen the law of cosines and most of y'all have totally forgotten the law of cosines. Is that about right? That's what it is every year. Okay, so it, it's an old fact about geometry. Uh, here's the way I want you to think about the law of cosines. It's a, it's a kind of a modification of the Pythagorean theorem. Note here, something squared is equal to something squared plus something squared. It starts off just like the Pythagorean theorem. right? It's just not exactly the Pythagorean theorem because this angle here is not a right angle. If that were a right angle, then we'd have just that, end of story. 
But because it's not a right angle, the law of cosines just tells us the correction term. Uh, and it happens to be the, you know, minus 2 times the product of the, uh, you know, what would be the legs of the other erstwhile um, right triangle times the cosine of that angle. It, so it's an old fact from high school geometry. But I'm just going to suck it down. Okay. So now what does that help us? What does that have to do with dot products? Um, so I'm going to introduce a metaphor here that I like. This is just for, I don't know, uh, interpretation purposes. But uh, I like to call this a mathematical bank shot. Right? So we're interested in understanding. We're interested in understanding a dot product. The very first thing that I've written down here is an expression, which is not what I'm interested in. And it turns out that by taking this expression, magnitude squared of V minus W, by trying to understand this in two different ways, right? I'm going to take the thing that I don't care about here, this thing that I don't care about, I'm going to compute it one way, I'm going to compute it a different way, and the result is going to be the thing that, that, I, that I do care about is equal to something that I can compute. So roughly speaking then, I get to there by going in a roundabout way by way of this thing that I in fact don't care about. I don't care about this thing intrinsically, it's just that understanding it helps me connect things that I do. So you can see the motivation for calling this a bank shot. It's just a, uh, uh, like I say, a kind of a interpretation of uh, you know, the strategy that we're about to do. So here's how it works. I'm gonna take this thing that I don't care about that I now know how to compute. Right? So what? I know how to compute something I'm not interested in. And I'm going to compute it a different way. Right? This is clearly the same thing. I'm going to compute that thing I don't care about differently. Here, I'm computing it as, well, notice, this is a magnitude squared. A magnitude squared, we just got through arguing, is a dot product of that vector with itself. And then you just foil that out. I think they still use the term foil in high schools. And so you take this product, foil it out, like so. Right? Recall dot product of a vector with itself is magnitude squared. Dot product of a vector with itself is magnitude squared. Right? And what we end up with is that this thing that I don't care about right, is equal to that. And of course, we previously showed that this thing that I don't care about is equal to that. I don't care about this magnitude squared of V minus W, and yet computing it has allowed me to conclude that that is equal to that. Cancel, cancel, common factor of minus 2 cancels, and we're left with what we were hoping to get, V dot W is equal to magnitude of V, magnitude of W, <coughs> theta, as desired. So, there's my little mathematical bank shot. Uh, so I only got to the thing I'm actually interested in, that this relates to that by taking something I don't care about and computing it two different ways. So, anyway, it's a cool calculation. Um, okay. Um, by the way, we didn't prove the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Let's see if I can... Okay. So we just got through proving this equation down here, that V dot W is computed with this you know, highly geometrically intense formula. Um, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality up here was our disappointment. It was, uh, eh, you know, it's sort of geometric related, but it's got sloppiness in it. And it brings up a pretty good question, which is, okay, well, if that's the case, then why is this one the one that has a name? Right? This is, you know, Cauchy and Schwartz attached themselves to their, like, hey, that's cool, and we're going to, you know, we're going to give this a name. And this is, um, 
Yeah, it's just a formula about the dot products doesn't really have a name. Why is that? Why is the good one unnamed? And the, the, the disappointment one is named. And uh, I'm not going to be able to give you a perfect answer to that question until you take Math 216, if you take Math 216. Um, and 216, what we're going to see is that the dot product is actually just a special case of a larger category of mathematical constructions called inner products. And it turns out that inner products uh, all satisfy an equivalent sort of comparable Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, all of them. Okay? So, so this here um, generalizes in very powerful ways. Um, yeah, I, I can't talk until we get to Math 216. I can't tell you what's so powerful about it. But really good things you can do with Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. This is fairly peculiar to Math 212. So, anyway. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, so let's see. Uh, now, of course, you can take this equation that we just proved. Uh, this is a formula for computing dot products, but if you just solve for theta, right, you can view this as a formula for computing angles, and that is actually a pretty neato thing. If I were to give you two vectors, um, if I were to give you W and V and ask you, uh, what is this angle? Right, what's the angle between those two vectors? You might think, okay, well, in the plane, in two dimensions, you could use what you know about trig and be like, okay, well, I can compute the angle from that to the y-axis here by sines and cosines, and then this angle, I compute with sines and cosines. You could sort of add them up. But what if you're in R3? How would you compute angles, you know, tilted angles like that? That's a hard geometry problem, right? And trig alone, it's not clear how you're going to do that. Uh, it's a hard question. Um, so the fact that you can just solve for theta, right, like so, and note everything on the right-hand side is easy to compute. If you give me two vectors, the dot product, easy to compute. The magnitudes, easy to compute. <laughs> Boom. I've got the angle. Right. Neat fact. That's just a rewriting of yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's just it's just solve for theta in uh, in this equation. Yeah, totally. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I have an example uh, here. This is I'm going to go super quickly through this example. But um, if here's two vectors, how do you find the angle between them? Well, the angle between them is the arc cosine of uh, you know just per the formula above dot product divided by the product of the magnitudes. Those are all easy to compute. So um, this goes there. These go there. And now it's just arithmetic. So neat calculation. Okay. Um, so I want to say a couple of quick words about uh, perpendicularity. Um, this uh, comes straight out of, and I'm going to come back to this formula up here, straight out of this formula again. Uh, let's kind of think through what would happen uh, if uh, what would happen if these two vectors P and W were perpendicular. Right? So if they're you know right angle between those two vectors. Okay, well if it's a right angle between the two vectors, then that means theta is 90 degrees or pi over two, right? which means cosine of that angle is zero, and that would mean that the dot product would have to be zero. So that's nice, right? Uh, perpendicular vectors, the dot product is zero. And you can kind of go the other way around. You can say, okay, well, what, is the, what would happen? I, I don't know the angle between the two vectors. But what happens if the dot product's equal to zero? Well, if the dot product's equal to zero, then one of these three things has to be zero, right? So either the cosine of theta is equal to zero, in which case we have a right angle, and so the vectors are perpendicular, um, or one of these magnitudes is zero. And that's kind of the sticky wicket. Um, it, I mean, if one of these vectors has magnitude equal to zero, let's say v, for example. What if, if, if v has magnitude equal to zero? Well, then v is the zero vector. I mean, magnitude tells you how long it is. If the magnitude is zero, then the vector is the zero vector. 
What direction does the zero vector point? It doesn't. It doesn't. It's not long enough to point in a direction, right? So, is it perpendicular to that vector? For example, is the zero vector perpendicular? It's a vacuous question, right? It doesn't have a direction, so its direction can't really be perpendicular to anything. So that's weird, right? Um, and kind of disappointing. And it's, uh, so other than this zero fact, it'd be tempting to say, hey, uh, if, it's a, if, it, if the vectors are perpendicular, the dot product is zero. If the dot product is zero, the vectors are perpendicular. It would not be nice... Uh, that perpendicularity and dot product being zero were just simultaneous. Um, but we don't have that again. You know, there's this unfortunate fact of uh, one of the vectors might be the zero vector. So, so that we don't have to constantly qualify what we mean, we, we have another word that we throw on it to kind of bypass this, well, either this or that uh, awkwardness. And the word is orthogonal. So orthogonal means something very similar to perpendicular. It just means that the dot product is equal to zero. That's what orthogonal means. And so if you say the two vectors are orthogonal, well, okay, that means the dot product is zero. Algebraically crisp. Orthogonal, dot product is zero. Geometrically, there's possibilities. Well, I mean, the vectors are probably perpendicular, but it could be one of these vacuous, weird, anomalous circumstances where one of the vectors is a zero vector and there is no notion of perpendicular and the blah, blah, blah. And so you just got to keep that in mind. Orthogonal and perpendicular are very, very close to each other in meaning, but with those exceptions. Um, so one way you could say it, um, the word orthogonal is algebraically convenient. It's a statement about the dot product, equals zero, crisp. Right? Perpendicular is geometrically convenient. Perpendicular means two directions, right angle. <coughs> right? And just keep in mind that they're not quite simultaneous. Okay. Okay. Um, so a couple of neat applications of dot products. Um, components are, um, it turns out to be very important in uh, physics calculations, and we're going to do a lot with components in this class as well. Uh, the idea is, um, suppose you have some vector w, and I want to think of w as helping me to define a direction. Its job is simply to define a direction. All right, that, so w is the direction that I'm interested in let's say. And by the way, why are we interested only in a single direction? Well, maybe we're playing football and uh, the ball was here and uh, then, you know, he gets tackled over here. How many yards of gain did he? Well, he didn't gain that many yards. Like he gained that many yards. This, that's the direction the field goes. I don't really care if he ran sideways. You know what I mean? Um, there's uh, physics examples that we're going to see in a couple of minutes about forces and work. Um, but anyway, so let's presume we're interested only in a certain direction. Uh, question then, given a vector, how would I compute how far it points in the relevant direction? Right, I don't really care about V. I just want to know to what extent does V point in the direction defined by W. So um, easy to write down the answer to that question uh, by looking at this triangle here. And uh, note that um, there we have a hypotenuse, there we have a side adjacent, and those are related by cosines. Right, so the component is just the magnitude of V times cosine theta. Just a little bit of trig uh, based off of this triangle. Okay, now. Um, what do you do with that fact? Um, <clears throat> am I going to have to go through and compute the angle? Oh, I, by the way, we can compute the angle. We can use the dot product to compute the angle. And then multiply by the magnitude, blah, blah. You can, but it turns out there's a little algebraic trickery that allows you to save yourself a step, and that is to observe that this formula here, magnitude times cosine of theta, looks very much cosmetically like the formula that we already know for dot product. It doesn't, all it needs is a magnitude of W, and this is the formula for dot product. Right, so the little slick move I like to pull is to take that formula that we, that we just wrote down there. Let me zoom. Um, 
So uh, component equals magnitude of V times cosine theta. There's the formula. And notice that I'm just going to multiply and divide by the same thing here. Perfectly legal. Multiplying and dividing by magnitude of W. Perfectly free. Didn't change anything. And then having done that, the numerator is exactly a dot product. And I have then a more convenient formula for computing components because dot products are easy to compute. Now, this is morally equivalent to computing the angle theta, <coughs> plugging in and using the previous formula we had. It's just algebraically more direct uh, to do it this way. Yep. Very nice, handy formula for components. Um, by the way, here's a rewrite of that. A rewrite of this formula is that it's V dot... Uh, w divided by the magnitude of W. And there you will notice uh, we have here a unit vector. Right? And what this says then, if you want to compute a component, you have a vector V, you want to compute the component in a certain direction, just take your vector V and dot it with the unit vector pointing in W's direction. That's kind of a neat neat application of unit vectors. Here's another way to say that. All we're interested in is the direction W points, right? Uh, I don't care how long W is. W's purpose is just to help me define a direction that I'm interested in. So the unit vector pointing in that direction is a natural way to represent the direction. So, different point of view. Okay. Uh, quick application to physics. Uh, I, by the way, uh, if if, uh, if you haven't had a high school physics class, and if you haven't seen this before, work with people with force times distance. Uh, no sweat. Um, it, it, working with force times distance is just a it's a way of uh, uh, computing how much energy it takes to accomplish a certain task. So y'all uh, may have just moved from. Uh, one dorm room to another dorm room, right? And uh, hypothetically, you may have had to carry a bunch of boxes up some stairs, let's just say. I don't know, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Uh, if you did, you're very familiar with the fact that having to exert force, <laughs> right, uh, over a certain distance requires a lot of work. Um, the higher up you have to carry the boxes, the greater the distance, the more work it is. Right? The heavier the box, oh, the heavier, the harder it is to carry it up whatever distance. Right? So, um, pretty reasonable uh, formula, force times distance. Now, there's an asterisk on this formula, though. The asterisk is in recognition of the fact that these might not be pointing in the same direction. So, for example, what if I wanted to take this pen here? It has a certain, right? It's got a certain force, certain amount of weight to it sitting there on the table, whoops, and suppose I wanted to move that pen um, two feet. Two feet is a distance, it has a force, and you're tempted to say, well, take the force and multiply by the distance. And then, like a smart aleck, I tap it there, and it rolls two feet horizontally. I didn't perform any significant work at all. Right, so force times distance doesn't really cut it. The point there is that the distance was that way the force was that way, right? So it doesn't count as work if you're going in a direction that's not the direction the force is, right? All we really care about is the extent to which I'm pushing in the direction I'm actually going. I don't really care how if, I mean, if I'm going that way. It's just it's a different, it's a disconnect kind of a thing. Okay, so that actually makes this a fairly awkward formula. I mean, we can say W equals FD, but it's not true <coughs> until I put asterisk with the understanding that we're looking at the component of the force in the direction of the distance that I'm actually traveling, which is all of a sudden awkward. Okay, so it uh, turns out dot products are a great tool for resolving this awkwardness. Uh, and uh, here's the idea. Um, if we're displacing ourselves in a certain direction, let's suppose that the displacement is, you know, like that. By the way, notice displacement's a vector. It's got a direction. It's not it's not a scalar. Isn't that weird? Look at this. I'm representing displacement by a scalar. Right? 
but we, we know displacement is not a scalar. That's, that's weird. Okay. And I want to know, okay, now in the direction of that displacement, I want to know, you know, what's the uh, component of the force. Okay, now wait a minute. Again, that force is a vector. Forces have directions. I'm representing it with a scalar. What is going on in this form? This formula is highly flawed. Right? It's misunderstanding the kinds of objects that the, that the participants actually are. It's, it's, it's a bad formula. <coughs> okay, so um, I want to know not what's this magnitude times that magnitude. I want to know just about the component of the force in the relevant direction, right? I want to, you know, drop this perpendicular. I want to know about that component of the force. That component, of course, is easy to compute. The component of the force in the direction of the displacement from the previous subsection, right? dot product divided by magnitude. And that's what I want to multiply by the distance. And, of course, the distance is... Um, well, let's see, let me do a different shade of green here. Um, the distance is the magnitude of the displacement. So, component times distance, this formula times that formula. Notice that when I multiply this times this, the magnitude of D cancels, and I get just F dot. D. And it's a really nice modification, sort of um, better way to understand the work formula. Don't think of work as being a scalar force times a scalar distance, asterisk, blah, 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 for discussion about directions and components and stuff. Understand force as a vector, as it naturally should be. Understand the displacement as a vector, as of course it naturally should be. Work is just a dot product crisp, right? Um, no little asterisk. Um, much more natural, ultimately natural statement. And uh, dot products are the uh, thing that make that possible to talk about. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to move on to the next section now. Uh, we're not going to finish this section. It looks like we've got 14 minutes left. Uh, but I want to make some good progress in here. Uh, we keep falling further behind. <laughs> eh. I always catch up eventually. Nothing to worry about. <laughs> but nevertheless, I always sweat it. Um, okay, so um, <clears throat> this is the second product. We're going to talk about the cross product. Uh, it turns out the cross product is very naturally related to another algebraic construction called the determinant that some of you all might have seen some facts about determinants in some previous courses. Just out of curiosity, how many people have seen determinants some way or another? Okay, yeah, cool. Um, you're going to learn more about determinants in uh, this section. Uh, and by the way, what I'm going to show you about determinants, some really neat facts about determinants that I'll bet you never saw before. This is still just the tip of the iceberg of determinants. It turns out there's a lot more to say about determinants. If you were to take Math 216, I will tell you much more information about determinants. And that is still not all of it. There's a, it's a tremendously uh, deep topic, but anyway. Okay, so cross products um, relate to determinants, and both of those relate to this other idea called right-hand order. And so I want to start by talking about right-hand order so we can get ourselves... Um, uh, it's, it's just a really convenient thing to have under our belt before we start talking about the other two. Uh, but our eventual goal is to talk about cross products. Okay, so right-hand order. Uh, I'm going to sort of segue into that by talking about um, a more familiar concept, which I think I have a picture of. Yeah, here we go. I want to talk about counterclockwise order versus clockwise order. This is a way of distinguishing um, two different ways that I could write down this pair of vectors, V and W. If I were to write uh, V comma W versus if I were to write W comma V, how would I distinguish between these two orderings? And I and I don't mean in a, I mean, alphabetically, right? So this is alphabetical, this is reverse alphabetical. It's not what I'm talking about. Right? Is there 
given a couple of vectors, is there a geometrically natural um, way to distinguish this listing from that listing? And the idea goes as follows. Uh, whichever vector you have listed first. Um, so let's let's focus on this this listing here. We'll come back to that guy. Uh, so V is listed first. Right. Note that that defines a line. And W, the second vector, points on uh, a well-defined side of the line. By the way, we're going to assume that these two vectors aren't parallel. If they're parallel, then the whole thing kind of goes out the window. Um, but uh, this is clearly on this side of the line, not that side of the line. Right? And how would I define which one is which side of the line? I'm just a real simple idea, but I'm going to use the idea that y'all are all familiar with the clockwise versus counterclockwise. From V, from the first vector, V, the quickest way to get into the direction that W is going is to rotate counterclockwise <coughs> in that case. Right, I mean, I guess you could get there by going clockwise, but that's the longer way. So we, we're going to choose the, the, our rule is going to be, to, you know, which, which direction is the quickest, the least angle to rotate V to point in the direction of W, and in this case, counterclockwise. So the listing V comma W, where V is first, we're going to call that a counterclockwise ordering. And on the other hand, if I were to look at this listing uh, here, W comma V, now W is the first vector. Same two vectors, by the way, same V, same W, right? It's just that now I'm listing W first. That defines that direction. And which way would I rotate to get to the direction that V is pointing? That being the second vector, I would go clockwise. All right, so V comma W, as I have them drawn, drawn here, V comma W is a counterclockwise ordering. W comma V is a clockwise ordering. Everybody see what I'm talking about? Not a very... I mean, it, it, the, the question comes up, who cares? Why are we talking about this? <laughs> it turns out to be surprisingly important. So we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but this serves as a great kind of segue into uh, the more really pressing question, which is, uh, is there a three-dimensional version of this? Instead of having two vectors in two dimensions that I could list, either the w, w, what if I had three vectors in three dimensions? And is there kind of a, uh, is there a clockwise, is there a notion of clockwise for three vectors in three dimensions? I mean, not really, right? I mean, it doesn't, clockwise is specific to two dimensions. So, but is there anything that behaves kind of like uh, clockwise and counterclockwise? Um, but for three three vectors in three dimensions. That's going to be our, our goal. Uh, now, I will start with one observation, and that is that clockwise and counterclockwise are mirror images of each other. So if you have... Um, this is... Uh, that's clockwise. If you take a reflection of it, then you get counterclockwise. So is there anything that, it, for three vectors in three dimensions, or anything that's kind of like that? And the answer is, it's, it's very hard to kind of come up with this on your own, but there is a totally acceptable way to do that, and that is to use your right hand uh, in the following way. Um, this was the hardest picture in the book to draw. Did say no? <laughs> it took me like an hour. Um, this is the gesture. This, this, this is, you, you have to you do exactly this gesture. Now, there's some important things about what I've done with the, this gesture is very specific. My index finger, you'll notice, is parallel to my palm. That's a rule. That's, that's what the gesture is. Okay, so there is no this. Don't do that. That's, that's a math crime. Okay. Index finger parallel to the palm. Middle finger bends the way middle fingers want to bend. Don't do that. Math crime. Okay. So, Index parallel to the palm. Middle finger bends the way the middle fingers want to bend. 
then notice that your thumb wants to point on a well-defined side of this plane, right? A and B, these first two vectors define a plane, and the thumb points that way. Now again, don't do any hand yoga, right? Um, so the way thumbs kind of want to go, it points on that side of the plane. And notice that no matter how A, no matter how, the, how those first two vectors are, your thumb always points clearly on one side of the plane defined by the first two vectors, right? So if you have an ordering, I see here, in fact, do I have the, yeah, here we go. If I've written down a, a list of vectors, uh, A, B, C, what you do is whichever vector is, uh, oops, whichever vector is listed first, point your index finger in the direction of the first vector. Whichever vector is listed second, get your middle finger pointing in that direction. Now think it through, by the way. I mean, you got to think about how you do, how your hand. I mean, it's real easy to point your index finger in the direction of the first vector, and then okay, now I've got to get my middle finger pointing that way. Look at the B vector; it's pointing like that. I, I can't, I can't do that. Well, you can take your whole hand. And while keeping your index finger pointing in the A direction, you could re, you could rotate your hand around. A is still, index finger is still pointing in the A direction, and just do whatever you got to do to your hand so that your middle finger can point in the direction you need to point. Okay. So, index finger first vector, middle finger second vector. Then the question comes: Does C, does the third vector, point in the same direction? you know, ish as your thumb? Does it point on the same side of the plane? You know, we've got this plane here defined by um, by the first two vectors. Does C point on the same side of the plane as your thumb? Or does it, as it might of course possibly point in the opposite side of the plane as your thumb? So, if it points on the same side as your thumb, C, you see in this case, points on the same side of the plane as my thumb, we call this a right hand order. Now, if C hypothetically were to point the other way, oh man, I didn't want to do that. Hang on. Um, if C were to point, um, let's suppose C pointed like uh, like uh, that, you know, kind of down. Right. That looks like it's along the x-axis. Sorry. Uh, if if it pointed, uh, you know, downward like that. First finger, second finger, thumb is that way, C is that way, it's the opposite side, and so we would say it's not in right hand order. Now, what order does it point? I would propose we call it left hand order. If you think about it, first vector, index finger, second vector, now note I've got to orient my hand around so that my middle finger, bending the way it's supposed to, can point in the direction of that second vector. Look at my thumb, it is now pointing the opposite direction. Right. So, index fingers and middle fingers lining up, thumbs point opposite directions. So, the opposite of right hand order is left hand order. So, as I have C drawn, as I have the third yellow vector indicated here, this would be a left hand order. Correct. This, this listing A, B, C, first, second, third, that listing is a left hand order. On the other hand, no pun intended, again, I keep erasing the thing there. Um, if I were to go back to the way I had it in the first place, C being like that, now that is a right-hand order. It turns out, oh yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, you had a hand, I thought it was a question. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was a... Do you always want to have your middle finger perpendicular to your... It, it doesn't have to be perpendicular, because the vectors A and B might not be perpendicular. So the only rule is, you know, keep in mind, your index has got to be parallel to your palm. Your index finger is not allowed to move, right? And your middle finger just has to bend in the direction it wants to bend. But the vectors might just not be perpendicular. Um, you just, uh, the idea of the middle finger bending the right, just don't do this is the point. Yeah, right. Because then you'd be like, you know, and you'd get all sorts of it'd be ambiguous. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yep. Um, what if C is pointing in the opposite direction? 
So exactly in the opposite direction. Yeah. Like, yeah. So yeah, so yes, you, you've got a great you've got a great question there. So in fact, let me let me um, generalize your question. What if C were parallel to this plane that's defined by A and B, right? If, what if C was so instead of having this or that, what if we had that, where all three of the vectors are coplanar, right? Um, and the answer is it's just like with clockwise and counterclockwise if the vectors are parallel. And it's a, there is no clockwise versus counterclockwise. If the vectors are pointing in the same direction, then you get neither. It's neither clockwise nor counterclockwise. Likewise, if C were pointing, you know, like that, then it's neither right-hand order nor left-hand order. Yeah. Okay, so you'd be surprised, but this is actually an important concept. By the way, notice that just in the same way that clockwise and counterclockwise are mirror images of each other, Right hands and left hands are mirror images of each other. Right, so if you take three vectors that are in right hand order, if you reflect all of them over some plane, their images, the reflected images, will be in the left hand order. Right? Here's another couple of facts, um, and I'm just going to appeal to your geometric intuition here. We'll prove it later. Um, God, I need to, I need to actually have some vectors that I can. Point two here. Uh, let's see. Where am I gonna? Uh, okay, I'm fine. I'll use this space. Now, let's imagine that we have. Okay, first vector. Hang on. First vector is that way. Second vector. That way. And third vector. That way, so I'm going to give these names. I'm going to call this one uh, A, and I'm going to call this one uh, B, and I'm going to call this one uh, C. Given this setup, let's consider uh, the um, let's consider the listing uh, A B C. Next, want to consider uh, C A B. Okay, now whoa, C A B means that now um, now C is first, A is second, B is third. So to to address this listing here, C A B. I, I can't, this is the wrong gesture. That's this. This addresses the question of A B C. <coughs> that addresses the question of C A B. C is first. A is second. B is third. Right. Okay. So now let me let me make an argument. What what do I feel like I've roughly demonstrated here? Um, I think this is pretty persuasive. That if A B C is a right hand listing. Then CAB is a right-hand listing, and the proof is this little gesture I'm making here, right? This, this. I mean, you see what I'm talking about, right? I mean, it's just a geometric appeal, and we'll make a more algebraic argument later. But um, um, these two listings, they're different listings, but they always have the same handedness. And likewise, BCA, and I, my, I don't have enough flexibility to. Uh, but you see what I'm talking about. So, because you can just kind of go one extra notch, or I guess I could go the other way. But um, this shows that those two listings, and actually, and the third, you know, as long as in some sense they're going around the same, you know, alphabetically around in the same order, they're either all right handed, or if the vectors were oriented differently, they'll be all left handed. But these, these listings always agree. I'm sorry, I lost track of time. I went over, um, I went over several minutes. Uh, okay, we'll call it a day. We'll pick up here on Friday tomorrow. See y'all later. Oh, uh, real quick about the homework. So we have finished now section 1.2. We have finished section 1.3. We have not finished section 1.4 here. Um, there's um, quite a bit more to do in 1.4. So, so the homework due Monday will be just sections 1, 2, and 1, 3. And I'll send out an email about that um, as soon as I get back to my office. Okay, see you later.